Okay, I apologize for that uh, small technical error. If I can, I'm going to edit those two videos together. Um, if not, that will just be the nature of the beast. Um, so in case I'm not able to splice those two videos together, this is, uh, I guess, part two of part seven of uh, this discussion series on Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, part two of the, of the same sort of uh, unitary block called What is Quality, where we're talking about fighters' experience teaching uh, rhetoric at the university. Okay, so let's see, where were we? Um, we were talking about the student who couldn't find anything to say, and I was mentioning that I see this quite a bit um, in myself and in uh, particularly in education among other students, and I think it exists more broadly as well, that uh, people have trouble sometimes, well, let's, let's take in the educational context, right? Um, there's this sense that in education, creativity is quite hard to teach. Um, and that our school system is really not very well set up at all for creativity. Um, and part of the reason for that is because um, grades seem to be kind of convergent, right? If I'm going to grade you, uh, if I'm going to evaluate your work, um, then not only is that a lot easier if everybody can hand in the exact same thing. Again, you know, it's like the hard sciences and math. If I can do, if I can grade using a Scantron, then that's going to be, you know, quite a bit easier. Um, it's going to be quite a bit easier than if, you know, I have to spend 15 minutes grading papers, grading each paper, excuse me, which is going to be hours and hours and hours. Um, remember, if you spend 15 minutes grading 20 students' papers, that is five hours of work. And let's suppose that you're teaching two sections of 20 students. Well, then that's eight hours of work. And, you know, you can all do the math from there. It can stack up pretty quickly. Um, that's certainly a lot harder and more time consuming than sending in a Scantron. So it's actually quite difficult to teach cre creativity. And it's uh, much easier in, in a school system, I mean, um, because the, the incentives for grading and evaluating make it so that it's much easier if you can get everybody towards some kind of convergent unitary answer. If everybody has different answers, that's a real problem even if those could all conceivably be good answers. They might be good answers, but there's no way for you, the teacher, to um, really evaluate that. Um, now, this is also true. It's, it's not just the convenience of grading. It's not just the convenience of grading, and it's not just the fact that, uh, you know, the grading system sort of tends towards this unitary, uh, towards unitary solutions instead of uh, divided, fragmented uh you know, diverse and variated uh, yeah, uh, solutions with the variations. Um, there's also a, a level on which um, for me to grade you, you know, I have to evaluate your work. And that means I have to assign value to your work, right? So this is a consistent problem that comes up in writing classes is what if your student writes, you know, it's, it's some kind of political or cultural topic and your student writes something that you deeply disagree with. Uh, you know, that's not necessarily the easiest situation to figure out how to negotiate. Because one thing you could say is, well, you know, as long as you make a good argument, right, then, you know, I'll grade you well, because I'm not grading you on your conclusions, I'm grading you on the quality of your argument. But on some level, you know, this, this can easily uh, descend into a kind of dishonesty, because obviously, if I thought your argument was good, well, then I would just agree, you know, if I really thought it was good, then I would just agree with your conclusion. Um, as well, but perhaps I don't agree with your conclusion. And so really to say, uh, you know, if your argument is, if, if the argument of the student really is good, then presumably it will persuade you. Um, and and then there's, there's no disagreement at all. And so you're just grading a paper with a student who disagrees with you. Uh, now, this is a consistent problem. In fact, um, you know, I had a professor and, and I'm not saying that you can't do it. I'm not saying that you can't effectively grade the papers of students who, um, who disagree with you politically or culturally, right? And I'm not saying that as a student, you can't write a paper that disagrees with your professor. In fact, uh, when I was doing my undergraduate degree, um, I took a couple of philosophy courses with uh, one of the world experts in this little sub-branch of philosophy called practical reasoning, which is basically the philosophy of, of, of how we justify our actions. And uh, he actually had a policy in his class that you could not write a paper agreeing with any of the positions that he had put forward. You were not allowed to agree with the professor. And the rationale for that was actually, you know, to, to promote um, some degree of uh, discussion and competition and creative thought. And I thought that was a pretty good policy. But I hope you can see that it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, fraught because uh, that means that, um, you know, if you're writing a paper that disagrees with him, he's very well suited to shoot you down. And he's potentially very inclined to shoot you down. So there is, you know, potentially some, some conflict of interest, let's say. Right. So not only is it the, not only is there the problem that, uh, 
you know, for teaching things like writing, uh, it, it, it's logistically difficult um, to reward creativity and to reward original seeing. It's, it's also, you know, uh, difficult on kind of a human level. It's difficult on a social level. It's difficult uh, on sort of this, this evaluative level to, to fairly see um, the views and positions of, of people who you disagree with, for example, right? Um, so the conclusion that Phaedrus comes to, and I think he's kind of right, that there is something in the school system that tends to, uh, that tends to indoctrinate, that tends to discourage creativity, and that tends to encourage imitation. The way he puts it, um, the way he puts it is, uh, he says, schools teach you to imitate. If you don't imitate what the teacher wants, you get a bad grade. And in college, it's a little more sophisticated. You need to imitate the teacher in such a way as to convince the teacher that you are not imitating the teacher. Um, you know, but you want to take the essence of the instruction, right? And that's what gets you an A. And originality, on the other hand, can get you anything from an A to an F. If you come up with something genuinely creative and interesting, then, uh, you know, maybe it genuinely is creative and interesting and your teacher will see its brilliance and grade you up. But they also might just say, you know, you really ought to stick with what everyone else has done before. Right. So, uh, you know, this is kind of a little easier to see in sort of the hard sciences where, you know, if you come up with some you know, genuinely, if you want to come up with some brilliant new theory of metaphysics that explains, you know, that that that, that reconciles deep questions of metaphysics and quantum mechanics and all that stuff, um, you know, your odds of doing that are very low. And if you try to do that in, uh, you know, uh, chemistry 150, right, you're just, you're, you're going to get an F. There's no way you're going to pull that off, right? It's much safer and you're much more likely to succeed if you report, you know, if you if you repeat back all the cultural and scientific conclusions that we have already accumulated over the past decades and centuries. Originality can get you anything from an A to an F, because remember, there is a small chance that you really have come up with something brilliant um, that will change the world. And there are occasional stories of that happening, but it's just, it's just not very probable. So the whole grading system cautions you against originality. It cautions you against that. And instead, it uh, cautions you towards imitation, even if Piercing will say that's a very creative imitation of, uh, you know, imitating your professors in such a way that they don't think you're, uh, they don't think you're imitating them, you know. So, for example, um, to take that, you know, even my my that very excellent philosophy professor who insisted that you could not write a paper agreeing with him, um, you know, if I had instead said, well, you know, I don't really want to write a paper. Instead, I'd rather do an interpretive dance for my for my term paper for my final assignment for the class i'd rather do an interpretive dance because i just feel like that'll explicate my ideas a lot better um now there's a possibility that i would get an a in that course if it was a really good creative dance you know a very good interpretive dance and it was put together very 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 well you know i might get an a but the much more likely case is that i will get an f right so even in situations where you actively encourage your students to not imitate you there's still this this enormous weight that is just always leaning on you and pushing you towards imitation and away from originality. And, you know, you see this in our school system. Um, most strikingly, and this was part of why I think it was so interesting for me to read as a high schooler, as I've mentioned, I was thinking a lot about education when I was a when I was in high school, partially because of my educational background and also because of the nature of the school I was in. Um, so there's there's this real temptation now uh, to to stray towards imitation, right? The temptation towards imitation. Um, now, let me tell you something interesting about the charter school that I went to, this public charter high school that I went to, uh, because I think it actually did a, a remarkably good job of escaping this kind of temptation towards imitation. Um, to give you an example, I believe this was my senior year. I, I had a history credit that I hadn't filled yet, and so I talked to the teacher and I said, you know, uh, like, you know me, you know a little bit of my educational background. I'm not going to get very much out of this class if I sit in the class with you. And what would be much more interesting for me is I'm actually really interested in language right now. I'm really interested in where language comes from. I'm interested in, you know, where written language started and where spoken language started and how that all started. So why don't I just go research that all semester, you know? Um, and my professor or my teacher, you know, my high school teacher actually permitted that. And I don't think that's a thing that would, you know, very easily get off the ground in a lot of public schools. You know, for those of you who have gone to public schools uh, for high school, you know, let me know what you think. But I don't think it would have gone over very well at all. Um, but it was the kind of thing that I could do at this uh, particular school. And so we actually did quite a good job of, uh, of resisting that tendency towards imitation. Um, part of the idea that fighters develops here is this idea of a, of a degreeless and gradeless university, 
right? So if imitation is a real evil that has to be stamped out before real teaching begins, you know, before real learning begins, which is what he says, um, you know, that's, that's, that's part of his belief. He says, as a result of his experiments, he concluded that imitation was a real evil that had to be broken before real rhetoric teaching could begin. And this imitation seemed to be an external compulsion. Little children didn't have it. It seemed to come later on, possibly as a result of school itself. Right. And I, and, you know, notice that this is also part of, uh, the whole thesis of the book, which is about systems of all kinds, whether that's your educational system, your political system, you know, corporations, your job, your culture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that there is a massive uh, and constant uh, pressure towards, towards imitation, towards conformity, right? And breaking out of that mold, breaking that conformity is difficult and dangerous. It's not like it can't be done. It can be done. Otherwise, we would never have anything new or interesting. Uh, but it's not easy to break that mold. And it's certainly not easy to break that mold in an in intelligent and interesting and helpful way. It's much more likely that when you break that mold, you'll just, you know, produce garbage. Okay, so, and this is where he comes up with this, this, this sort of idea that, well, maybe you would have a degreeless and gradeless institution. So you would remove from other people, you would remove from the students this external evaluation that tells you what to say and what to do, right? So, um, and that the product of this was that students would be able to see for themselves uh, in the same way that that particular student, the girl with the thick, -eyed gla with the thick lensed glasses who, who couldn't figure out what to write, uh, when she wanted to write about Bozeman, Montana, or about the United States, you know, that 500-word essay, but could when she focused it down to just one brick on the opera house, um, she does manage to do that, and she manages to see for herself. She sees originally and directly without just uh, restating the ideas that other people have said. That's sort of his thesis about it, is that's sort of his, his explanation of it, is that the reason why she can't figure out what to say is because she keeps trying to say what other people have said about Bozeman, Montana, but no one has said anything interesting about Bozeman, Montana, and so she, so she's just kind of stuck. My apologies if anyone from Bozeman, Montana, uh, happens to be listening to this. I'm sure there's lots of interesting things to say. Well, and, you know, Piercing will say so as well because the student does find interesting things to say. <clears throat> and so he runs a few other experiments, right? Um, you know, he has them write about the back of their hand. And he has them write about uh, a coin. And he has them write about their thumb. And um, so his explanation for this is that they're blocked because they're trying to repeat um, things that they've already heard. Um, and when you narrow it down to something as, as small as a coin or the back of your hand or one brick on the opera house of, in the main street of Bozeman, Montana, it becomes obvious that you have to see for yourself. You're not able to repeat what other people have said. You're not able to imitate. It's an opportunity that is denied to you and you are compelled to see freshly, directly, and originally. Um, and he actually tests this out. He tries holding back grades from his students. Um, and what's really interesting is, is the, their, their sort of uh, the results of this system. Um, and I've wondered what would have happened if I didn't, if I had done this in the writing courses that I taught at a university level, I don't think it, it would be hard to pull off well. And that's part of the conclusion that he comes to. But what's very interesting is that he finds that the A students actually really like, or excuse me, hang on. He says, yeah, the A students are two to one in favor of, excuse me, the A students are two to one in favor of no grades. And his hypothesis about that is that the A students really are motivated and interested, and so they have less need for the grades to tell them if they're doing well. And the B and C students are evenly divided, divided on whether or not having no grades is a good idea, and the Ds and Fs are unanimously opposed. So there is something here that, you know, those who truly master material don't need anyone else to tell them what's good and bad. They don't need that grading system to tell them whether their work is good or bad. It's those who haven't mastered uh, material, those who haven't mastered that subject area or that skill that really need someone to come in and tell them if they're getting by, if they're doing good enough, right? And many of you have probably had, you know, uh, experiences analogous to this, if, you know, those of you who are in college or have been in college, right, that there is a tendency to focus on the grades in classes. There's a tendency to focus on the degree and to totally ignore the real learning that's taking place. And, you know, we're going to bear the consequences of this culturally because we're going to have a lot of students who have gone to college and have potentially even gone into debt to go to college, uh, potentially even significant amounts of debt, right? And they come out of all that and they really, you know, they have the, they have the grades and they have the degrees, right? They have the C's, they have the degrees. Um, and they're not really well equipped for the job that they have been hypothetically prepared for. 
Right now, I'm not saying that that describes everybody, obviously. There are lots of very competent and qualified people who graduate from college, and there are lots of people who get a wonderful experience at college and genuinely learn uh, sets of knowledge and arrays of skills that will help them uh, in their chosen profession and also help them more broadly in life. But there's also many people, you know, and, and you and I are among them, um, to one degree or another, who cannot remember the least thing that they learned in that class in college, right? Because uh, they did it for the grades. They didn't do it for the learning. They did it to imitate what the teacher wanted. And they did it to imitate what the university system wanted. And, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be too harsh here, because um, I understand some of the reasons, and this is, you know, the, the most extreme version of it. But in, in some sense, you know, they've sold their souls, right? They outsourced their own quality decisions. They said, hey, you know, I don't know what's good. I'm not going to decide what's good. Instead, I'm just going to imitate what my teacher wants. I'm going to do what my teacher wants, and my teacher is going to give me a grade, and then I'm going to graduate, and everything's going to be okay. And I think there's a very good chance, in fact, I think there's a near certainty, that if you go down that road, uh, you will emerge from the university without the skills you need to succeed in life. And then you're potentially in debt, you're potentially stuck, you don't know what to do with your life, and you can't do anything with your life because you haven't learned anything really useful because you spend all your time imitating you've never made any good you've never made any any decisions on your own now again i'm stating the strongest version of this case here right i, I don't agree entirely with that strongest version of the case um, but it's but it's worth considering it's worth thinking about because it's a universal tendency and you know it's a universal tendency because you and i have both had the experience you know i'm assuming that you have gone to college of, of going through a course and not really learning anything because you were learning it for the test. You were learning it for the professor. You were learning it for the degree. You weren't learning it for everything else. And so once the test was gone, once the degree was gone, once the professor was gone, you know, there's, there's, your brain has no reason to remember or apply it. And so it doesn't. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, so far so good, right? So what's interesting is that he says this actually causes a problem. <sighs> The movement from his inquiry, excuse me, the movement from this to his inquiry into quality took place because of a sinister aspect of grading that the withholding of grades exposed. Now, this is really interesting. Grades really cover up failure to teach. A bad instructor can go through an entire quarter, leaving absolutely nothing memorable in the minds of his class, curve out the scores on an irrelevant test, and leave the impression that some have learned and some have not. And by the way, this is true. <laughs> And I'm not saying that this happens at all universities, and I'm not saying that this happens at all courses, in all classes. I think, obviously, you know, there are good classes and there are good students out there. Absolutely. And I'm not even going to speculate on the relative uh, proportions of those. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, even as a writing teacher, you know, I curve out all the grades at the end. Well, actually, I didn't curve the grades, um, although professors who tell you that they're not grading on a curve are probably lying, just so you know. Um, and I'd, I'd be happy to explain that if anyone's curious about that. Um, but it's very easy, you know, I know that, you know, some people have to get an A, right? And so I just, you know, kind of follow my gut as I'm grading these papers and I have some evaluative criteria, but ultimately I'm kind of just following my own intuitions about what, um, about what is good writing and what is not good writing. And then at the end of the semester, I give some people A's and, and I give the impression that something has been learned, but it's actually quite difficult to tell if I actually taught them anything, if they actually learned anything in that class or if it was things that they already knew. And it's difficult to tell if the things that I'm teaching are the things that they are learning. Um, it's, it's not easy at all to pick this up, uh, to pick up what's going on here. Um, it's not at all easy to tell if you really are genuinely teaching well, right? A bad instructor can go through an entire quarter or, you know, in our day's semester, leaving absolutely nothing memorable in the minds of the students and then, you know, just curve it all out on the final grades and leave the impression that something has been learned when nothing really has been learned. Um, oh, I actually do want to mention one quick thing about the Sargasso Sea of Stagnated Logic um, that is teaching rhetoric that I uh, neglected to mention earlier about the difficulty of evaluating writing and the difficulty of teaching writing and the difficulty of learning writing. So there actually has been academic research done that indicates that even when writing teachers have a rubric, right, even when they have a structured way to evaluate a paper and grade them, what they still end up doing is they end up um, kind of going by their gut and then justifying it using the rubric that they have already made. Uh, so once again, it's a gigantic sargasso sea of stagnated logic. It's very difficult to structure. It's very difficult to structure. Okay, so, all right, so grades cover up a failure to teach. If the grades are removed, the class is forced to wonder each day what it's really learning, right? You're forced to wonder, well, why am I sitting in this seat? Why am I reading these books? Why am I writing these papers? What's it all for? Because it's not for a grade anymore, because 
there are no grades. The questions, what is being taught? What's the goal? How do the lectures and assignments accomplish the goal become ominous? The removal of grades exposes a huge and frightening vacuum. By the way, you might want to try, if you're in college right now or high school, you know, stop and think about this for a minute. And, you know, you could probably apply this in a workplace too. Stop and think about this for a moment and, and, and just, just stop and think, okay, what if the grades are not here? What is the good of the assignments I'm doing? Are my professor's lectures helping me? Are my studies helping me? Is this, is this degree going to help me? Is this college experience helping me? You may come to some interesting conclusions, right? Remember, the grades are presumably supposed to be a proxy for learning, right? So you need to be able to look under the surface and say, is learning really happening? And if it's not, then there's a real problem. Even, excuse me, even if you are getting those good grades or acceptable grades or, you know, whatever it is that you're aiming for, right? So you need to have something to aim for. And if it's not the grades, what is it? You have to ask that question. And so when you withhold the grades, it exposes this huge vacuum. I imagine the way it would apply in a workplace uh, is that, you know, if you have a boss or a supervisor, they kind of tell you what it is that you need to do. They kind of, they have the vision in mind of where everything is going. And, uh, you know, potentially you're kind of, at least potentially, you're kind of a trained monkey. Um, you know, you follow their instructions. So they decide where the ship is going and your job is just to reef sails and swab the deck. Um, when I was a young teenager, I did quite a bit of property maintenance work with my grandpa. And one of the things that he would say uh, again and again is that the difference between a man and a boy is that a boy needs to be told what to do, but a man doesn't need to be told what to do. And by the way, I certainly don't think that that is uh, necessarily gender specific at all. Um, but my point here is that if you don't need to be told what to do, that means that you've shouldered the responsibility of saying, here are my goals, here are my aims, and here's how I'm going to get there. You become the captain of a ship, you know, or at least the first mate, rather than just the guy who reefs the sails and swabs the deck, right? And the problem is that in many jobs and in education, there are many students and many workers who are reefing the sails and swabbing the deck and don't have any kind of ownership, sense of ownership or sense of responsibility, um, or sense of any real direction at all. And it's just absolutely, it's absolutely cancerous. Uh, it, it, it's, this, it's, this, it's this terrible acid that dissolves our lives because um, humans actually ought to have responsibility and humans actually ought to think about final ends, you know, in at least some capacity. They should not just be trained monkeys. They should not. Um, at least that's certainly my feeling. I think it's a very common sense intuition, frankly. Um, anyway, so Phaedrus is obviously talking about this in the context of education, right? That there's way too many students who are just trained monkeys who are, um, you know, doing things for the grades, right? And by the way, if you are in school, I, you know, I challenge you to find some way to make your education not that way, right? So I told you about one experience I had, right? Um, where I, you know, in high school in my senior year, I went to my professor and I said, look, you know, how about I don't do the normal curriculum? How about instead I go and study the origins of written and spoken language and then I do a presentation for the class at the end of the semester, or I write a paper, right? And you talk with them and you work out what would be acceptable. Now, this is not always easy and hard and you need to find sympathetic professors and teachers because a lot of professors and teachers, again, they're not incentivized to help you be creative because it's hard. It's harder for them to help you be creative. It requires more work on their part, right? They would prefer the scantrons in many respects, but you know, there are many teachers and professors who will help you. I'll give you another example of this. When I was doing my, uh, well, no, actually, I'll give you two more examples of this that are very comparable because I did this both in my uh, undergrad studies and in my graduate studies. There's often something called a directed readings course or a directed study course. And basically what it is, is it's, you know, if there is something you want to study that is not well encapsulated by the college catalog of classes, you can actually, um, with a faculty sponsor, design your own class. And I did that as an undergrad and coupled it with an internship. And it was, it was moderately productive. It was not the most productive experience I've ever had, but it was moderately productive. I certainly could have done a better job at it. Um, the one that was really insanely productive was when I was doing my master's degree in English, um, I squinted at the curriculum. And I've talked about this a bit on the, here on, in this series of lectures, that um, the study of English is broken into two halves. There's the Master of Arts in English, which is where you study and analyze works of literature. And then there's the Master of Fine Arts in English, which is where instead of, you know, primarily studying works of literature, instead of analyzing them, what you do is you try to create them. So if you're trying to write a book, you're going to do an MFA, Master of Fine Arts. Now, if you're trying to um, analyze somebody else's book, you're going to do a Master of Arts. So I was doing the Master of Arts in English, the MA, right? Um, and so I squinted at this and I thought, you know, this is kind of interesting because I don't see any place in the whole graduate program at my university, I don't see any place for somebody to actually practice rhetoric 
we study rhetoric, we don't practice it. So I talked to one of my professors, actually I had to talk to a couple professors to find you know, somebody who, who had ideas that would work with mine and was willing to sponsor the project. Um, and I, I found one eventually and I said, okay, well, what I wanna do is I wanna design a course where instead of just studying and analyzing rhetoric, instead of just doing rhetorical criticism, I wanna practice it. I wanna write, you know, I wanna, I wanna do what Cicero would have done, right? Or do what US presidents do or do what, you know, politicians and businessmen of all kinds do, right? Is I want to, I want to write, I want to practice writing and speaking. And so we designed a curriculum um, based upon that. And I, I produced, I, I can't even remember, you know, probably around, what did I do? Something like 70 pages single spaced. I produced something like 70 pages single spaced of writing that semester. Now that's a lot. You know, in many of my other courses, I probably, you know, the single spaced equivalent, I probably only had to produce 10 pages single spaced, right? So I was working very hard and every week I was meeting with that professor designing that, you know, to, to, to keep up on things, to discuss my insights with her, um, to learn from her um, and for her to check on my progress, right? Um, but I did that and it was one of the most insanely productive school courses I have ever taken. And the reason why was because I wasn't just trying to imitate what the system wanted me to do. I wasn't just trying to imitate what my professors wanted me to do. Instead, what I was trying to do was I was trying to see originally and directly. I had a question, right? What would this kind of course look like? And why don't we do this in universities? And how helpful would it be? And I inquired into that question, right? And I went and practiced. I wrote 70 pages single space and I learned an incredible amount. Um, and most importantly, I learned an incredible, you know, there's, part, there's two reasons why I learned an incredible amount or two sort of important aspects of that. One is that I learned an incredible amount because it was what I wanted to learn. Um, and the second reason, or the second aspect of that though, um, is that I learned things that were genuinely useful. You know, we all have experiences of, of going through experiences that just, you know, they don't teach us anything. They slide off our backs like, like water off a, they, you know, they just slide off us like water off a duck's back. Um, there's nothing there that sticks, right? There's nothing there that sticks. And in this course, I found a way to make it stick. Um, so I, I, man, I challenge you to do that. If uh, I challenge you to find a way to, you know, take your job or take your education into your own hands, right? And find a way to make it high quality. Find a way to resist that temptation to imitate, that resist that temptation to conform, and instead find something, you know, interesting and productive and helpful and creative. Um, all right, so. And, and this actually kind of presages everything that I'm about to say from, from Phaedrus. So Phaedrus says, you know, okay, so if you remove the grades, you create this giant vacuum. So what is it you're aiming for if you're not aiming for the grades? And he says it creates this Kafka-esque situation. If you don't know about Franz Kafka, Franz Kafka writes this absurdist literature um, that's just, it's, it's like mental torture because none of it makes any sense, right? Uh, it's a Kafka-esque situation in which they saw they were, they were to be punished for failure to do something, but no one would tell them what they were supposed to do. Right? So they look within themselves, they see nothing. They look at Phaedrus and they, the teacher and they see nothing and they just sit there helpless not knowing what to do and the vacuum is deadly. And apparently one student actually suffered a nervous breakdown, which is you know, quite unfortunate. I hope that turned out well for them eventually. You cannot, create, you cannot withhold grades and sit there and create a goalless vacuum. You have to provide some goal for the class to work towards to fill that vacuum. And he wasn't providing anything like that. And so eventually he drops out this experiment and goes back to normal teaching and he's confused and... and, and uh, depressed because he wasn't able to find the solution. Okay, so here's where things get interesting, right? Is there's this wave of thought that crystallizes around this idea called quality. The way this all comes back to Piercing, because remember, Piercing in the present on the motorcycle trip goes back and visits this college and gets this wave of memories, right? And the most important memory that comes back, let me pull it up. Um, is He's walking through the university where he used to teach and he finds his old office and he remembers this this old lady named Sarah right who comes walking by her office his office frequently and she's carrying water she's gonna go water the potted plants and it says she says in a la da sing-song voice in a lady of her final year before retirement about to water her plants she says I hope you are teaching quality to your students all right um, and the way he describes this is, is a seed crystal and the experience from the chemistry lab that he compares this to is that it actually turns out that, you know, uh, for instance, if you dissolve too much sugar, it's, it's called a supersaturated solution. Basically, um, when you increase the temperature of a liquid, you can dissolve more stuff inside it. So you heat up the water, you dissolve a, a ton more sugar in it than it's normally able to handle. And then when it cools, 
you know, hypothetically it crystallizes, and this is how you get rock candy, which is awesome stuff, in spite of the fact that it's just sugar. Uh, but it's somehow it's really cool. Um, anyway, so what happens though is that sometimes it doesn't crystallize. It needs something to crystallize around, which is why, you know, when you make rock candy, you'll drip some kind of like string in there or a stick and then it crystallizes around the stick. It needs something to stick to. Um, but apparently, uh, you know, it, it needs that seed crystal. It needs that first crystal and then everything crystallizes outwards from then. So that's what happens to it, right? So Sarah comes waltzing by again and again saying, I hope you're teaching quality to your students, right? And, uh, she says, I'm so happy you're teaching quality this quarter. Hardly anyone is these days. And he says, well, I am. I'm definitely making a point of it. She says, good. And she goes on. And he has this experience where he stops and thinks about it. And he, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll read most of it because it's just so good. He returned to his notes, but it wasn't long before thought about them was interrupted by a recall of her strange remark. What the hell was she talking about? Quality? Of course he was teaching quality. Who wasn't? He continued with the notes. Soon the thought interrupted him again. Quality? There was something irritating, even angering about that question. He thought about it, and then thought some more, and then looked out the window, and then thought about it some more. Quality? Four hours later, he still sat there with his feet on the window ledge and stared out into what had become a dark sky. The phone rang, and it was his wife calling to find out what had happened. He told her he would be home soon, but then forgot about this, and everything else. It wasn't until three o'clock in the morning that he wearily confessed to himself that he didn't have a clue as to what quality was, picked up his briefcase, and headed home. Most people would have forgotten about quality at this point or just left it hanging suspended because they were getting nowhere and had other things to do, but he was so despondent about his own inability to teach what he believed, he really didn't give a damn about whatever else it was he was supposed to do. And when he woke up the next morning, there was quality staring him in the face. Three hours of sleep, and he was so tired, he knew he wouldn't be up to giving a lecture that day, and besides, his notes had never been completed. So he wrote on the blackboard, write a 350-word essay answering the question, what is quality in thought and statement? And then he sat by the radiator while they wrote and thought about quality himself. At the end of the hour, no one seemed to have finished, so he allowed the students to take their papers home. This class didn't meet again for two days, and that gave him some time to think about the question some more, too. During the interim, he saw some of the students walking between classes. He nodded to them, and he got looks of anger and fear in return. He guessed they were having the same trouble he was. Quality. You know what it is, yet you don't know what it is. But that's self-contradictory. But some things are better than others. That is, they have more quality. But when you try to say what the quality is, apart from the things that have it, it all goes poof. There's nothing to talk about. But if you can't say what quality is, how do you know what it is, or how do you know that it even exists? If no one knows what it is, then for all practical purposes, it doesn't exist at all. But for all practical purposes, it really does exist. What else are the grades based on? Why else would people pay fortunes for some things and throw others in the trash pile? Obviously, some things are better than others, but what's the betterness? So round and round you go, spinning mental wheels and nowhere finding any place to get traction. What the hell is quality? What is it? Okay. I love that section so much. To me, that's the, I mean, well, and I think Pierce would agree, this is the most important idea in the whole book, right? And certainly one of the most important sections in the whole book. Okay, so he goes on to describe this about their reaction. There's a large fragment concerning Phaedrus's first class after he gave that assignment on what is quality and thought and statement. Almost everyone seemed as frustrated and angered as he had been by the question. By the way, I invite you to sort of sit and ponder this for a second, right? So hypothetically, he's teaching quality to his students, right? And I can think about this in terms of my time teaching writing at the university. And, you know, if you've taken a writing class at some point, you could think about it in terms of that or perhaps in terms of some other class. Obviously there, in that class, I'm supposed to be teaching quality. You know, I'm supposed to be helping the students write better, right? Write something higher quality, write something with more quality. Right. Okay. So I can look at some things and say that some things are better than others. And, you know, presumably I can't even make choices unless I think that some things are better than others. You know, otherwise I would just stay in bed all day because I would not be able to see that getting out of bed might be better. You know, I wouldn't have any basis for choosing delicious foods over, over bland foods. And I wouldn't have any preference for choosing healthy foods over non-healthy foods. I wouldn't have any way to distinguish between vehicles to buy or places to go because, uh, you know, they would all be equal in, in how good they are, right? What their quality is. So quality definitely is there, but uh, it's not easy to figure out what, what that 
quality is, what that betterness is. Like, uh, what is it about it that makes it better? Now you say, well, in writing, you know, it's organization, it's this, that, and the other. Well, okay, but is it that in cars? Is it that in food? You know, because I have yet to eat a hamburger that has a footnote attached to it. <clears throat> but I have yet to see a good freshman academic essay that doesn't have a footnote attached to it. So it's not the footnotes, but the footnotes have to be there for the paper to be high quality. So it's actually quite difficult to isolate. Um, and if you sit and stew about that, I think you'll probably come to a lot of the same conclusions that he comes to. So everyone's frustrated in the classroom and they say, how are we supposed to know what quality is? You're supposed to tell us. And he tells them that he can't figure it out either and that he really actually does want to know and that he actually wants to know what they think. And apparently they make so much noise about this um, that another teacher sticks their head in the door to see what's going on. And Phaedra says, it's all right. We just accidentally stumbled over a genuine question and the shock is hard to recover from. So Ben Nichols, and thanks, by the way, for making the comment, Ben Nichols, persistence and function. I think that that certainly can be. And yet, um, I don't think that can be all it is, right? Because we actually like things, some things to stop functioning, right? Um, you know, for instance, I, I want my microwave to stop microwaving things. Now, and I anticipate your objection, and it's a very good objection, right? Your objection is, well, but what a microwave is, is it's something that stops and keeps going, right? And, and I'm like, okay, you know, but we can, steep, we can, we can keep on going that up, you, uh, you know, uh, bumping that up because a microwave, um, you know, how high quality is the microwave? Well, you know, in some respects, a toaster oven or an oven is going to be much higher quality. And, you know, some people don't have microwaves at all because they find them to be low quality. There's also the issue that, um, you know, persistence and function, although it's certainly, you know, like I want my car to persist in its function. I want my, my, my microwave to be mechanically reliable. You know, uh, what about the, you know, I mean, to take the most hackneyed obvious example ever right you know uh, what about the concentration camps you know what happens if those ovens are just persisting perfectly in their functions well you know um if that's quality i don't want it man you know uh it uh it doesn't seem to quite capture although i certainly think i actually and uh, sorry i'm being kind of hard on that answer I, I think there's more to that answer than i'm um letting on but i, I and i certainly think it's a good answer but i think i and also Piercy would probably say that it, it doesn't it doesn't quite capture everything about quality it doesn't quite capture everything about betterness um although i actually i actually like that more and more if you interpret it in the right way um and and thanks thanks in any case you know thanks thanks for for uh jumping in i don't mean to you know it's the perpetual risk of a teacher that uh you know if they jump on their students ideas or you know in, in this case just my listeners ideas and they'll stop commenting so i really do appreciate it and if you have a rebuttal for what i said i would love to hear it uh or even just thoughts um okay so remember th this is the whole thing here right is they're supposed to imitate what he tells them about quality they're not actually supposed to ask the question what is quality and so what he eventually comes up with is he says i think there is such a thing as quality I think there is such a thing as betterness. But as soon as you try to define it, something goes haywire. You can't do it. And so the definition that he eventually works up for quality is he says, quality is a characteristic of thought and statement. Remember, this is in a writing classroom, so he's using it specifically to describe writing instead of microwaves, as I did perhaps slightly clumsily a moment ago. Quality is a characteristic of thought and statement that is recognized by a non-thinking process. Because definitions are a product of rigid formal thinking, quality cannot be defined. Now notice he's doing something kind of, you know, like a philosopher, a trained philosopher would shoot this down in half a second. He points this out, right? It, this definition is actually a refusal to define, you know, and he says this, when I say quality cannot be defined, I'm really saying formally in terms of sort of formal descriptions that you're stupid about quality. You don't know anything about quality if you can't define it, right? I'm gonna read that definition that he gives once more. Quality is a characteristic of thought and statement Right. If we were going to extend the definition, we'd say about anything. It's a quality. It's a characteristic of people. It's a, it's a characteristic of things. It's a characteristic of cars. It's a characteristic of schools. It's a characteristic of relationships um, that is recognized by a non-thinking process. Right. Now, notice if it's non-thinking, it's not going to be rational or logical or scientific or philosophic in many of the ways that we normally think about those terms, Right, because all of those are thinking processes. Because definitions are a product of rigid formal thinking, quality cannot be defined, right? So this refusal to define things, re refusal to define quality rather. And then below that definition, he says, but even though quality cannot be defined, you know what quality is, right? So this is the key idea of this whole section. Two, two things, two truths. You know what quality is, you can't define it. 
don't have a definition of what it is, but you can recognize us. These two truths, those are the two most important truths that are two most important ideas, at least, right, that that Piercing is trying to get across in these chapters. Um, yeah, and I agree with you, Ben Nichols. Uh, so, you know, I'd be curious how you take up, you know, some of the other... Um, some of the other problems, like for instance, you know, uh, gas chambers, right? And uh, you know, the logical uh, rebuttal to gas chamber gas chambers example is going to be, well, you know, uh, that's the difference between moral quality and technical quality. And uh, Piercing is going to tackle that in a second because he doesn't believe that there's a difference between moral and technical quality. He thinks that they're united at a base level. Um, but that's something we're going to get to in a bit, right? Okay. So the key here is, again, even though quality cannot be defined, you know what it is. And the way he demonstrates this to his students is he shows them a bunch of papers and he asks them to rate the papers, you know, which one is higher quality. And what he finds is that, you know, consistently they rate some papers better than others. And so what he says is, whatever caused you, whatever caused the vast majority of you to say that this paper is better than that paper, whatever it is that caused that, that's quality. And this is such an interesting approach, right? And and again, uh, remember, and he, he runs through this argument a little bit later in the chapter, right? How do you know that quality is real if you can't define it? And what he does is he says, well, you know, let's try subtracting quality from the world and see what's left. Because if you subtract something from the world, then the world is different. And that means that that something is real. You know, whatever it is, it's definitely real. Um, you know, in the same way that... Uh, you know, how do you know that uh, this wall is not a figment of your imagination? How do you know that it's real? And, you know, part of the answer is, well, can you walk through it? Because if you run into it, right, then it's probably real. And if you remove that wall and you now can walk through that space, uh, you know, then that wall is probably real. If you can tell the difference between a world with it and a world without it, then it must be real, even if you can't define it. That's the structure of the argument. So he starts uh, removing things, right? Um, And so he says, okay, let's take the world, let's subtract quality from it. So let's subtract betterness. Let's subtract any kind of value distinction. So he says, well, the fine arts are gone. And the reason why is because, uh, you know, if the bare wall looks just as good as a painting, there's no point to hanging the painting. So there's no fine arts in a qualityless world, right? And there's also no point to symphonies because scratches on the record are just as good as symphonies in a qualityless world. You wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. You wouldn't be able to tell that one was better than another, and so you just listen to scratches instead of symphonies, or maybe listen to neither, or listen to both without being able to tell a difference between them. He says poetry is gone because it doesn't make sense, it's no, it has no practical value, and he thinks comedy would disappear too, which I actually think is quite right, and he says uh, no one would understand the jokes since the difference between humor and no humor is pure quality. Now he says sports disappear, right? There's no football, there's no baseball, there's no games of any kind because, you know, the numbers on the board, right? The score, it's just empty statistics. It's like the number of stones in a pile of gravel, right? Uh, you know, if you don't care that this team has more points than the other points, if there's not something better about having more points, if there's no quality there, then, uh, you know, who's going to watch and pay attention to the way the scores interact with each other, right? It would be the same as if you went and counted the grains of sand on the beach. There'd just be no point to it. Um, in fact, he says, you know, the, the idea of point is, is in fact an idea based in quality. If there's a point to something, what you're saying is that thing has quality. And if there's no point to it, what you're saying is that it's low quality or that it has no quality at all, right? And so, um, you know, he keeps going along these lines, right? He says, um, you know, subtract it from the marketplace, right? Subtract it from uh, <clears throat> goods and services, right? So quality of flavor is meaningless, right? You know, Wagyu steak doesn't taste any better than dollar store steak. So, you know, why bother having Wagyu steak, right? He thinks that supermarkets would just carry basic grains like rice, cornmeal, soybeans, and flour because, you know, the difference between good flavor and bad flavor is a quality difference. Um, you know, you would need milk for weaning infants, vitamin and mineral supplements, but you wouldn't really care about anything of this, right? All, the, all kinds of beverages, there would be no sport drinks, no alcohol, no tea, no coffee, no tobacco. Um, there'd be no movies, no dances, plays, or parties. You'd all use public transportation. You'd all wear GI clothes, general issue clothes, because, you know, one set of clothes wouldn't be any better than another. It wouldn't be any higher quality. Um, and what he finds, what, what he also thinks is that most people, like a lot of jobs, would go away. Um, but they'd be re relocated into essential non-quality work. And what he thinks is that um, the pure science, mathematics, philosophy, and logic would be pretty much unchanged because those, those don't deal with quality. Those don't deal with val value judgments at all, is what he thinks. And he says, um, 
By subtracting quality from a picture of the world as we know it, he'd revealed a magnitude of importance of this term he hadn't known was there. The world can function without it, but life would be so dull as to be hardly worth living. In fact, it wouldn't be worth living. The term worth is a quality term. Life would just be living without any values or purpose at all. So you look back all over, at, over all that and you say, okay, look, quality has to be real. It has to be real. Because if we take quality out of a world, there's a massive difference. So maybe I can't define what quality is. Maybe I can't tell you what it is. Maybe it's hard to specify, but it's definitely there. You know, and maybe you could think about it in terms of like dark matter or dark energy. You know, things that we know very little about, but that we have uh, good reason through the empirical sciences to believe exist, right? So I can't tell you much about it, but I can tell you that it's there. Because if it's not there, then, you know, there are measurable phenomena in the world that are left unexplained, right? Uh, you know, detectable phenomena in the world that are left unexplained. So if you remove quality from the world, there are detectable phenomena that are left unexplained. Uh, you know, all kinds of things, music, flavor, um, you know, all kinds of worth in life. All right, so let's see. Do we want to talk about this part? Oh, th this is kind of actually interesting, is he thinks that this qualityless world actually bears some resemblances to social situations like ancient Sparta, communist Russia, communist China, the brave new world in Aldous Huxley, George Orwell's 1984, um, qualityless world, right? Where there's not worth, right? And, um, okay. And he thinks that this qualityless world that where there are still uh, many of the hard sciences and there's still mathematics and logic um, he calls it squareness, right? And and this is actually really key, is he thinks that the attitude behind that is um, that it's not just that it's intellectual, it's not just that it's intelligent, it's an attitude about the way the world is. It's a presumptive vision that it, ran, that it runs according to laws and reasons, and that man's improvement lies chiefly in the discovery of those laws of reasons, laws of reason and the application of them towards satisfaction of his own desires. Okay. And in fact, he has a definition for, for squareness. And, and this is interesting because remember, he's an intellectually trained individual and he says that he writes this with some beginning awareness that he's involved in intellectual suicide, a strange kind of intellectual suicide. He says, squareness may be succinctly and yet thoroughly defined as an inability to see quality before it's been intellectually defined. That is, before it gets all chopped up into words. We have proved that quality, though undefined, exists. Its existence can be seen empirically in the classroom and can be demonstrated logically by showing that a world without it cannot exist as we know it. What remains to be seen, the thing to be analyzed, is not quality, but those peculiar habits of thought called squareness that sometimes prevent us from seeing it. Thus did he seek to turn the attack. The subject for analysis, the patient on the table, was no longer quality, but analysis itself. Remember, analysis is that thing that cuts up and divides things and, and understands them and categorizes them and sorts them, Right? So now quality is not on the table. Quality is not the thing that it needs to be analyzed. Quality is fine. You can see what quality is, right? Um, quality is fine, he says. But analysis seems to have something wrong with it that actually prevents it from seeing the obvious. Okay, so let's let's pause for just a second and recap here because we need to we need to get a sense of where we're at, right? So this quality idea is key to his whole life, is key to everything that Piercing has said and is going to say in this book. And you know, I think there's lots of points where you can push back on Piercing. I'm not sure this is one of them. I think I think it's very hard to get around Piercing's position here. If, so let's let's move through it slowly. So I think I think you have to agree with him that quality exists. Um, you know, I think if you really didn't think that quality existed, and I think if you really acted out the idea that quality didn't exist, that there was nothing better about anything, as far as I can tell, you would never act at all right? You would never be able to be grateful for anything. You would never be able to move towards any kind of goal whatsoever. You would never be able to get grades in school because it would be just as good to not get good grades. You would never be able to go to work because it would be just as good to stay home. You would never uh, have any incentive to do anything because to say that something is an incentive is to say that it's better than the alternative. In other words, that it has more quality. Um, so as, as far as I'm concerned, I do not think that there is a way I, I'm, I'm dead convinced that there is not a way around Phaedrus's argument here. I think, I think everyone believes in quality. I think they may not say that they believe in quality. I think they may argue about what quality is, but I think everybody certainly acts as though they believe in quality, whatever it is that they say. Okay, so this is interesting because when we think about metaphysics, what, what Phaedrus, what Piercing is about to do, really both of them, 
is they're about to perform a Copernican inversion. They're about to turn our world upside down. Now, think about the world right now. What you think about the world is probably you think about it in terms of physical objects and also perhaps in terms of uh, subjective mental ideas and values, right? Um, things like beauty, morality, and goodness. And then, you, you know, primarily, though, the world is made of physical objects. Um, now, Phaedrus is about to perform a Copernican inversion. He's about to flip all of this upside down. He's about to say, okay, what if the world was not primarily made of physical objects and mental ideas? What if this thing that we call quality, this betterness, this goodness, this value, this worth, um, was actually the fundamental fact of existence? What if it was deeper down in the structure of existence than physical objects or mental ideas? What if it was the foundation upon which the universe rests? And the rest of the book is, be is basically an explanation of what that would look like. Now, I find this to be very intriguing because there are people who can deny, and, and this is it's such a clever philosophic argument in a way, um, because there are people who can deny that the physical universe exists. They're called idealists. You know, maybe you believe that we all live in the matrix. We all live in a computer simulation. There are people who can deny that. And although I certainly don't think it's a helpful way to live, like, you know, it has a fair amount of, you know, logical consistency. Like, is it possible we're living in the matrix? Sure, it's possible. It's hard to disprove, but it's certainly possible. I can imagine it, um, you know, and there are also people who believe that, you know, there is nothing truly subjective. There is nothing truly mental. All of it uh, can be eventually pulled back to atoms. And if we really understood the physical laws that govern the physical universe, if we understood all the movements of atoms and we understood ch chemistry and, bio and biology precisely, we would understand everything that's going on in your head. You know, there is no free will. There is no, there's nothing individual and subjective and personal about you. It is all reducible to deterministic physical laws, right? So there are people who deny the existence of the mind independent of matter. And there are people who deny the existence of matter independent of the mind. Right. Both of those are, you know, I, again, I don't think either of those positions is correct, but they are certainly positions that many philosophers have advanced and that have, you know, at least semi-plausible justifications for them. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so, so Ben Nichols raises, I'm assuming you're talking about the, uh, the Matrix example, right? They deny that you're in a Matrix until you inflict pain on them, then it's plenty real. Yeah, and I guess my response to that is, well, you know, of course I'm going to react as if it's real because you're triggering all the right... Uh, you know, chemicals in my brain because I'm hooked up to a, I'm a brain in a vat and you're just pushing all the right buttons so that it feels real. And it feels real to me. I don't deny that, but like, you know, there's, there's something you know, about that that's, you know, still unreal. Although I think you do actually raise a good point. I don't know if you're pulling that from Jordan Peterson or not, but Jordan Peterson does raise this point. And I think it is quite an interesting point that humans have a very hard time denying pain, denying the existence of pain, right? Uh, they have a very hard time doing that, uh, especially when they're in that pain. Right. And I actually think, you know, Peterson doesn't talk about this, but I think the inverse is true, too. I think that people actually have a very hard time denying the existence of some kind of uh, some kind of transcendent ideal when they experience it. Now, after you experience it, there's all kinds of alternate explanations you can have for it. You can rationalize it away and you can, to some degree, do the same thing with pain. But I think that when people genuinely experience some kind of transcendent goodness in their lives, it becomes very, very, very difficult to just pretend that it doesn't exist. Uh, ben Nichols, the lobster. Yes, here we go. Of, of, of course, of course. Um, by the way, now's as good a place as ever to parenthetically note um, Ben Nichols and anyone else who's interested in Jordan Peterson or Sam Harris's work, if you listen to their conversations, they're rehashing a lot of the ground that is covered in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. So I actually think that um, the metaphysics in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance clears up a lot of their disagreements. Yeah, that's obviously, a, a, that's an opinion that I can't justify here because I'm trying to talk about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance instead of Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris. Um, but but if you're interested, if there were interest in that, I would love to spell that out because I do think that Piercing, uh supplies a needed, a needed metaphysical contribution to Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson's repeated conversations. Um, so, well, that's good. So let's, uh, yeah, so, okay. So there are people who deny the existence of subjective reality and say it's all, it's all matter. It's all physical matter and it's all the natural laws that they operate according to. And there are also people who will totally deny the existence of, of the body. They'll totally deny the existence of physical matter. And to some degree, these views have something to say for them. They're at least semi-plausible. Like you can understand, um, 
Yeah, I do agree, Ben Nichols, that everything is one, if I understand you correctly. And, and no, please don't shut up. Uh, you know, at least at this moment, you're the only person participating in chat, so I need you, Ben. Um, so, uh, so there are people, you know, there are at least semi-plausible arguments to be made for those positions. I don't, I cannot find a plausible argument that quality isn't real. And I can't find a human being who acts out the belief that quality isn't real. I don't think, I don't think that such a human being exists. And, you know, I, I welcome, I would be interested to hear the counter argument. I don't, I don't think there is one. Um, to me, it just seems so patently obvious that value pervades every decision and thought that we make in the world. Um, the only way that you could sincerely act out the belief that quality isn't real is by just sitting there and doing nothing. You know, and even that, if you're making that decision as opposed to doing something else, then you're acting out the belief that sitting there and doing nothing is superior, right? So maybe if you obliterated consciousness entirely, maybe then you could live in a qualityless world. That's the only even possible line of argument I can see. But, you know, you and I are obviously conscious since we are talking uh, to each other right now. And so I, I think for any conscious being, there's probably not a line of argument that there isn't such a thing as quality. I think you're just trapped into believing that there is quality. Um, Okay, so that's the first step. Now, the next step, this is important. Can quality be defined? Piercing is going to say no. And that's very, very, very important to the arguments he's going to make. And I think that this is probably a more contentious point. I think you can make arguments that quality can be defined. And, you know, people throughout history have made arguments that quality can be defined, right? Um, I mean, in some sense, this is what all philosophies are, are attempts to define what quality is, um, or at least almost all philosophies, right? So if you look at, I don't know, Ayn Rand's objectivism, I'm thinking of the ideal, I can't remember which book it's in, whether it's in The Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged, but at the end of the book when one of the heroes says, you know, um, I swear by my life and, my love of, and the love of my life that I will uh, never live for another human being nor ask another human being to live for me, something along those lines, right? Um, that's an assertion of, you know, what a quality life looks like at least. Um, Right. And if you, you know, obviously, if you look at uh, religions, Buddhism or Islam or Christianity or, you know, a scientific atheism, all of these have ideas about what a quality existence looks like, what quality looks like. Um, you know, uh, you could say that, you know, for instance, in, in monotheistic religions, the quality is, is, is God. That is, in some sense, a definition of what quality is. Right. Um, which is why, you know, there's no such thing in these monotheistic religions as good rebellion against God. There's just no such thing. It would be incomprehensible. Um, so I think it is, it's, it's more contentious, and we're going to deal with that later. I know we're going, we're already uh, at an hour, and that means we've done an hour and 15 minutes because I already talked a little bit. We're going to go just a little bit further. Um, so thank you for tracking with me. Um, but I don't think you can get out of the idea that quality is real. You might be able to get out of the idea that quality can't be defined, although we'll talk about that. Um, right, we'll continue to talk about that. Okay, let's see. And actually, I've been going for so long, I need to reorient, reorient myself ever so slightly. Now, he believes, all right, his position that quality can't be defined. One of the examples that he gives, um, let's see. One of the reasons that he's saying that quality can't be defined is that quality seems to be a thing that you perceive before you have an explanation of it, right? So you perceive that the writing is better, and then you come up with your reason why. And this is actually, um, and this is actually, you know, I mentioned the research that indicates that this is what writing teachers actually do. Even if they do have a rubric, even if they define what good quality writing is, they won't actually follow that rubric. Instead, they'll follow, you know, they'll have an intuitive sense of how good the paper is. And then, you know, they'll massage the rubric until the rubric fits, until the grade fits, until the grade from the rubric fits their, uh, their sort of intuitive understanding of how good the paper is. Now, that'll be close to what the rubric grading is probably. Um, but notice that the rubric is sort of an approximation. It's a guide, um, right? So, and th this brings us all the way back to the sand sorting analogy from a couple videos ago. Right, the sand sorter analogy, right? So there's an endless landscape of awareness around us and consciousness takes one handful of sand and then the, and that's romantic understanding, contemplation of that unsorted sand. And then the analytic knife goes to work and chops it up into all sorts of structures and that's classic understanding. Now, what, what Piercing is pointing out here is what he thinks is going on is that betterness 
is actually operating prior to that intellectual analytic knife. Betterness, that sense of betterness, that sense of quality, is actually what happens. Um, uh, it's what happens when you grab the handful of sand, basically. It's, it's quality that guides your selection of sand. And this is why in all of the analytic, classical, the most analytic and classical um, disciplines we have, like mathematics and logic and science, these seem to be value-free. There seems to be no quality at all, because the quality isn't in the organization and structure. It's in what guided the, the creation of the organization and structure, right? So that's a helpful linkage back to his previous ideas. So what that ends up meaning is that science and technology and, uh, and, and so forth are not precisely value-free. There's something guiding the creation of those classic structures. Um, and, you know, in the same way that, let's see, what would be a good example? Well, let's, let's leave that be for now and come back to it. Um, and by the way, uh, you know, Piercing, as far as I can tell, is not saying here that you can't ever say anything about quality, right? So for instance, you know, Ben Nichols' de definition that it's persistence and function. I think what Piercing's response would be is, yeah, that's a pretty good approximation, but there will be exceptions. And there will also be aspects of quality that are not captured by it. Um, okay. So remember, this is this is what um, this this non-definition. Sorry, there's a quote here that I need to find to to explain this a little bit better. But it's a little bit further up. Now notice that this is in some sense, right? The quality identification happens pre-rationally, because, or at least it does for Piercing and his students, because they can't define what quality is, right? At least they they don't have a satisfactory definition as far as they're concerned. Of what quality writing is and by the way this is you know what i told my students right um a little while ago i mentioned that i asked them you know so do you want to be able to write something short or something long do you want to be able to write it in uh you know this very um uh, uh, casual personable tone or do you want to be able to write it in a formal elegant tone and the answer is well both depending on the situation right there's not one single definition that can guide you in all of these cases right so so that seems like a disaster right? Because if you can't define it, you can't teach it. But what Piercing is saying here, what, or what Phaedrus, I guess, is saying here in the classroom, and I think Piercing agrees, but what Phaedrus is saying here in the classroom is, no, you can tell what quality is before you define it. Now that's a big deal, because if you can tell what quality is before you define it, then that means that the definition is actually, uh, to one degree or another, superfluous or unnecessary. It's non-essential. You don't actually need the definition, because you can just see it. Now, the definition might be helpful and it might be interesting, but what's really interesting here to Phaedrus is the fact that you're just seeing what quality is before it's explained to you. So before that whole classic structure goes to work, before language goes to work, before structure goes to work, before rationality goes to work, before logic goes to work, before all these uh, you know, systems of division and, and connection go to work, there is some kind of power that you have to detect better and worse. And that's all prior to language, that's all prior to description, that's all prior to definition. And you know that because you can tell whether or not something is good before you have an explanation for why it is good. And actually, um, he gives a phenomenal example of this a little bit later where he talks about, uh, you know, he says, uh, uh, if you take, uh, I think it's some kind of amoeba and you put a drop of dilute sulfuric acid next to it, then the amoeba will shrink away. And he says, if the amoeba could talk, what the amoeba would say is, this is a low quality situation and it would escape that low quality situation. Now the amoeba can't talk, right? It can't talk, it doesn't have rationality. It doesn't have any kind of thought process at all, right? Uh, it doesn't have a nervous system. It doesn't have anything, right? But it's still responding to quality. And what that seems to establish as far as Phaedrus is concerned is that quality is pre-intellectual. Now it has an intellectual dimension too. You can describe it in an intellectual way, but you can't exhaust it with that intellectual description. There's always more, right? There's always more. There's always something underneath it brewing that's pre-intellectual. The way you could kind of think about it is that he thinks that logic, rationality, and descriptions and definitions um, are like the, well, they're, they're descriptions. They're not the thing itself, right? When you describe something, you have the description and then you also have the thing itself. And so what he's saying is, well, you know, I can describe quality, but what's really interesting is that there's this thing that I'm describing 
that is prior to my description of it. Um, sorry. The function, so Ben Nichols says, the function of writing is communication. There is a greater quality. This is a greater quality sentence than dit on tessad bon sar. Yeah, I mean, you know, I certainly agree with you. If, if, if dit on tessad bon sar is, uh, you know, means something in some other language, you know, and there's somebody in the chat who can parse that for us and interpret it, and maybe, you know, the secrets to the universe are there. Um, yes. Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll talk more about the function of writing as communication, especially when we get to talking about the Greeks, because I have some really interesting stuff to say about that. But that is all way in the future. Okay. And remember, this quality, uh, Phaedrus is saying, is it something that you see? It's something you just see. You just look at the paper and you know what it is. Um, let's see. Actually, I apologize. I'm going to take just a 30-second break here so that I can parse this properly and reorient myself. And maybe I'll be able to get just a little bit further and organize this a little bit better. And... Uh, by the way, if you think this is intellectually outrageous, then Phaedrus actually, to some degree, agrees with you. He says this is just intellectually outrageous. He's not teaching anymore. He's indoctrinating. I think that's actually a little bit too strong, but you know, he's speaking for effect here. He had erected an imaginary entity, defined it as incapable of definition, told the students over their own protests that they knew what it was, and demonstrated this by a technique that was as confusing logically as the term itself. And he says he's able to get away with this because logical refutation required more talent than any of the students had. Um, and he develops this routine where he continually has them look at papers and evaluate them for which ones are higher quality and which ones are not higher quality. And they keep on saying that some are higher quality in the same way that, you know, Ben Nichols in chat right now is saying, the function of writing is communication. That's a better sentence than dit on tessat bomsar. Well, why is that better? Right? Um, and now you can say, you can say, uh, you can say quite a few things, right? Uh, you know, for instance, did on Tessat Bonsar doesn't make sense in English at all, right? But then the answer is, well, okay, so that's that's true for this situation, right? You know, quality seems to be a universal a universal something or other that is guiding everything. But the definitions of it are insufficient because if I define that sentence as, well, it's, it's good because it's in English, it's like, well, no, there are a lot of good sentences in other languages. Well, it's good because it communicates something to me. Well, but what if you were communicating something, you know, terrible or obscene or malicious, um, or, or something like that to me. Well, would that still be quality? Well, well no, right? Um, ah, yeah, so Ben Nichols comments, right, that the, the gibberish sentence did on Tessat Bonsar, um, you know, its function was to create confusion, so its quality wasn't so bad after all, right? So this actually gets quite confusing, right? The quality is there, but it's very difficult to define, right? Um, so he basically traps them into saying, Phaedrus, and what is not good, need we ask anyone to tell these things? To tell us these things and phaedrus's answer is no no you know what quality is in writing you can look at those two papers and tell which one is better you know in the chat right now you can look at those two sentences that ben nichols typed and you can tell which one is. you can think about your day and tell which one is better and if you can't it's usually because the two things that you're considering or weighing are very very close in quality and so he says eventually students get bored by this right um you know okay so we know what you mean by quality it's the betterness and we know we can tell quality is uh, very good, right? So then the question is, all right, get it. How do you get high quality writing? And what he says is, um, now at last the standard rhetoric texts came into their own. The principles expounded in them were no longer rules to rebel against, not ultimates in themselves, but just techniques, gimmicks for producing what really counted and stood independently of the techniques, quality. And so this starts, he says, as heresy from traditional rhetoric, but then it turns production to it. A lot of aspects of quality of writing like unity, vividness, authority, economy, sensitivity, clarity, emphasis, flow, suspense, brilliance, precision, proportion, depth, and so on. And you can keep each of those poorly defined, but demonstrate them by the same techniques, right? And you can show how different writing techniques will amplify different aspects of quality. For instance, if you want to amplify the authority of a text, then you can use a technique called notes, right? So now, Notice that your the footnotes aren't just, well, you know, your paper needs to have, you know, 15 footnotes because that's what we want. Instead, it's, we're aiming for quality. We need a quality paper. Now, if what you sense about that quality, about that paper is that it needs more of the authority aspect of quality, well, then here's a technique to do that. All of the, all of these techniques are no longer ends in themselves. They're not just, uh, you know, imitative exercises to learn, but instead they're focused towards uh, towards a goal. And it's a goal not that is imitative, but that is located 
you know, the perception of which is located in the student himself. The student can tell what's quality and what's not quality. And so the student themselves, the, themselves can look at the student, the student him or herself can look at the paper and say, hmm, you know, uh, my paper, you know, it, it doesn't seem to be as high quality as it could. Maybe what it needs, it's not very fun to read, right? So it doesn't, that, that aspect of quality that is entertainingness. It needs a little bit more of that. So maybe I could throw in some kind of story or anecdote or example, right? Or maybe I could throw in, you know, some, some clever wordplay. Maybe that would help, right? Um, right, and so now uh, he actually mentions this as his experience as, as a teacher. Oh, yeah, well, he says, if a student turns in a bunch of dumb references or a sloppy outline that showed that the student was just fulfilling an assignment by rote, the student could be told that while his paper may have fulfilled the letter of the assignment, it obviously didn't fulfill the goal of quality and was therefore worthless. So do you want to know why you sometimes have that low quality experience of being in a classroom and even though you fulfill all the technical requirements, you're like, this is dumb and this is, this is, you know, this is not high quality. Well, the reason why is because you're not aiming for quality at all. You're just aiming for imitation. And so if you stop and think, well, what is quality in this situation? Or what, what would be quality here? What would be higher quality now? That's going to lead you in all kinds of interesting places. By the way, I hope I'm aware that there's a little bit of noise in the background. I hope that that's not um, too distracting, and I, and I do apologize for that. Okay. Now, in answer to the eternal student question, how do I do this, that had frustrated him to the point of resignation, he could reply, it doesn't make a bit of difference how you do it, just so long as it's good. The reluctant student might ask in class, but how do we know what's good? But almost before the question was out of his mouth, he would realize the answer had already been supplied. Some other student would usually tell him, you just see it. If he said, no, I don't, he'd be told, yes, you do. He proved it. And this is one of my most favorite sentences from all these chapters. The student was finally and completely trapped into making quality judgments for himself. And it was just exactly this and nothing else that taught him to write. So do you want to know how to make a good classroom experience? Stop making it imitative, right? And this works just as well from the teacher's perspective as it does from the student's perspective. If you want to have a good experience in a classroom or in a job, stop trying to imitate, you know, the forms and patterns that, that you're tempted to imitate. Instead, just trap yourself into finally making quality judgments for, judgments for yourself. Look at it and say, what would be quality here? And if what you're doing is quality, keep doing it. And if what you're doing is not quality, then sit and think about it and figure out something that's higher quality. And when you figured out something, ask yourself, well, would this be higher quality? If the answer is yes, then do it. And, and I really do think that this is actually, I mean, I think it's a near universal, if not solution, at least a near universal technique for, you know, if you're in some kind of low quality situation, like stop and think about it and think, you know, what would be higher quality? Don't just think, you know, what is it my boss wants me to do? Or what is it I need to do? Um, to keep the job, or what is it that I need to do to fulfill requirements X, Y, and Z of my boss, or what is it that I need to do to, fu to fulfill requirements X, Y, and Z of my professor? Now, those can be good questions, right? Just like all the rhetorical techniques can come into their own, but they have to be nested under this overarching question of what is good? What would be best? What would be valuable? What would be worthwhile? What would be high quality? And I honestly think, like, I really do think this, that if, if, people stopped and asked themselves that question, we would solve, excuse me, if people stopped and asked themselves that question, we would answer an incredible host of questions that we have today in society, and we would solve a whole host of problems, and we would resolve a whole host of conundrums and just little bits of friction that exist in people's lives. Um, we need to learn and cultivate, cultivate that ability to look directly at things and say, is it good? And if there's nothing else that we take from this book, if there's nothing else that we take from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, what we should take from it is this one lesson, that there is such a thing as quality and that you know what it is. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let that sink in for a second. Okay, I believe we're getting near the end. Um, there's, I, I just need to orient myself so I know what to stick into the next lecture. Um, okay, this is actually a pretty good place to end. What I do want to point out very briefly is something from the narrative dimension of this text, remember? So right now what's happening is that Piercing and Chris are actually hiking up a mountain. And this is the section about ego climbing. Um, 
what's going on is that Chris, when he's climbing the mountain, has this sort of uh, goal of looking good, right? This goal of proving himself. Um, and uh, it, it's causing all kinds of problems on the hike. It's uh, causing, causing uh, lots of problems. Oh, boy. Uh, you know, yeah, I apologize once more for the quality. It's not the first time I've done it, and I'm afraid it will not be the last time I've done it. I'm hoping to move to a location where I, where I will have higher quality internet soon. And until then, thank you for suffering with this to the degree that all of you are. Um, Piercing actually tells an experience about uh, one of his own experiences hiking. Um, he says that when he was in India at the Benares Hindu University, um, he uh, participated in a pilgrimage to the holy Mount Kailas, which is the source of the Ganges. And in Hindu legend is the abode of Shiva high in the Himalayas. And he went with a holy man and his adherents. And what actually turned out is that Piercing never reached the mountain. After the third day, he gave up exhausted and the pilgrimage went on without him. And in this letter describing it, what, what Phaedra said is that he had the physical strength, but the physical strength wasn't enough. He had the intellectual motivation, but that wasn't enough either. Um, and what he says was he was trying to use the mountain for his own purposes and the pilgrimage too. He regarded himself as the fixed entity, not the pilgrimage or the mountain, and thus wasn't ready for it. He speculated that the other pilgrims, the ones who reached the mountain, probably sensed the holiness of the mountain so intensely that each footstep was an act of devotion, an act of submission to this holiness. The holiness of the mountain infused, their own, infused into their own spirits enabled them to endure far more than anything he, with his greater physical strength, could take. Right, and he contrasts this to Chris's experience climbing that he calls ego climbing. Right, and this, this ego climbing, hang on, let me find where he describes it. Let's see. 